my screen. Okay, I'm gonna yes. see. Great. I'm just going to Okay, great. So um this is the common yellow throat. You'll hear more about why that's my starting bird. Um Welcome everybody. This will give you uh, a background about our program. I understand from Bronwyn that um, our attendees tonight are members of communities across Maryland. So hopefully when you're done hearing my presentation, um, if you think your community might be interested in um, becoming a bird city community, um, we can get in touch and I can get your community started on the process. Let me, so let's just start and talk about, before I even go into what is a bird city, more why this program started. Um, as many of you know, birds need our help. Um, Three billion birds were lost in North America since 1970. And that means that our ecosystems are no longer um, have a capacity to support bird life. So bird cities are communities that have been designated for their work um, in increasing and creating habitat and protecting existing habitat, removing and reducing threats to birds, educating and engaging people and promoting sustainability. So a lot of communities um, want to help birds, but they don't know how. And so Bird City is their guide. It's sort of a blueprint for communities so that they can learn different actions via the application process. And it allows a lot of conservation initiatives tend to be, especially around habitat protection and um, creation tend to be more rural. So this allows more urban communities um, to have this blueprint of actions that they can take to help birds. So there's many reasons why communities might choose to become a bird city. And uh, I just wanna pause here and say that um, when I say the word community, it means a city, a campus or a county. So I'm just sort of grouping them in um, with the word community. Um, so many reasons that uh, communities might choose to become a bird city. Um, when you manage green space to benefit birds, this not only creates a better habitat for birds, but it also for people, um, as well as uh, birds sort of can act as an umbrella species where when you create good habitat for birds, all the species, other species also benefit. Um, so you have improved ecosystem health. Um, there are lots of really wonderful um, conservation uh, programs in Maryland that are recognition programs like Bird City Maryland. Um, so this um, cities that tend to be bird cities are also tree cities or bee cities, or um, they've been uh, recognized as a sustainable Maryland city. So they have a lot of pride in, um, in their environmental reputation and they want to um, make sure that that reputation is known throughout the state. So um, Annapolis is um, one of our bird cities and um, they have banners with their Annapolis city logo that they line Main Street with during migration. Um, one of the components that sort of we ask of all of our bird city communities is that they celebrate World Migratory Bird Day. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little while, but I just want to bring that up when I saw their banner picture. So uh, lots of partnerships are formed when um, the application is filled out. Usually it's filled out by a team of people in the community that's made up by uh, a community, like usually a bird club member or somebody who was in with the Natural History Society would be a perfect choice. Somebody who's in the city government and or an educator um, that has sort of their finger on the pulse of all of the different types of things that are happening throughout uh, a community. So this um, idea of a bird city started in Wisconsin um, in 2009, and they were inspired by Tree City USA, which has been in existence for 50 years. Um, 
and Wisconsin recognized their first uh, community in 2010 and has since grown to have hundreds of communities in Wisconsin that are recognized as bird cities. So this was a really very successful initiative and a lot of uh, other states decided that they wanted to try to replicate it. Um, so by 2021, there were 10 different programs that had sort of organically grown out of Wisconsin's example, but they were all sort of operating independently. Um, and Maryland was one of them. We started in 2019. So at, in 2021, the Bird City Network was formed and this was a way of uniting all of these diverse programs throughout the US and um, Latin America. And the Bird City Network is sort of powered by the American Bird Conservancy and the Environment for the Americas with support from Fish and Wildlife and um, the Urban Bird Treaty uh, Program. And the Environment for the Americas is the organization that generates the annual theme for World Migratory Bird Day. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So this coalition now has a national platform and you can see that Maryland is one of uh, eight states and Mexico and Colombia have also joined. And on the national level, the goal is to have all 50 states have a some type of bird city or bird town program. Um, so they are actively working to expand and I think already are have several new states that they're getting ready to bring on board. But this, this coalition here, you can see it represented on the map, <clears throat> really has been uh, a way of sort of uniting and showing the power of collective action. So Maryland has been really excited to be a part of the national coalition and its partnerships that, um, that have allowed us to really grow our program in ways that we weren't able to just sort of working alone. Um, okay, so as I mentioned when we first started, um, we started in 2019 and we presently have seven communities recognized in Maryland, three cities, um, La Plata, um, which was our first city, Annapolis and Salisbury, and four campuses, um, College of Southern Maryland, Salisbury University, Washington College, and University of Maryland College Park. And our program, and the way I like to think about it is that we're celebrating what communities are already doing. Um, so whenever I start um, talking with a community, I will look and um, look at their sustainability page, see what they're already doing, um, invite them to fill out the application. And then the application itself <clears throat> is a tool to educate communities about issues and solutions. So there are actions embedded into each um, category of our application that is that blueprint that I was talking about that cities can say, oh, all right, this is something that I could do that would be actively helping um, eliminate or remove a threat to birds. So um, we also wanna motivate, we have different um, levels of being a bird city. So if you have 10 action points, you come in at just sort of the regular level. If you have 20 um, or more, you're a high flyer. So when they renew, we hope that they will add more actions as they learn about them through the application process. Um, Bronwyn, just checking in with you, how's my, am I going too fast? <laughs> Is the pacing okay? Yep, you're fine. Okay, great. This is only my second, I was telling Bronwyn, only the second time I run through this uh, slide deck. Um, so right now, the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership just consists of my position. Um, and it normally has an executive director, which will be filled um, this spring. And then um, uh, some volunteers who are overseeing the Farmland Raptor Program and the Eagle Nest Monitoring Program. I want to talk about our logo for just a quick minute. Um, it's what you see on the right-hand corner of the screen. 
So um, our rogue, our logo is what's on our signs. It's one on our banners. Um, and the background colors are supposed to represent the water is blue, the land is green, and the um, habitats ranging from the mountains of Western Maryland to the Atlantic coast. We have the um, leaf representing our white oak, Quercus alba, Maryland's state tree. Um, and it's particularly important to note that the um, oak trees host more caterpillar species than any other tree genus. And they provide a lot of food and shelter for our native birds. So, as, and, and particularly, um, even if you're if a bird is not an insectivore, it will feed its um, its babies insects. So having host trees that have that are native that have um, big species counts like the oaks are really important for Maryland's birds. And then um, the common yellowthroat is found throughout our entire state during the nesting season from April to August, and it was a uh, one of the earliest species described from the New World and was initially called the Maryland yellow throat. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, Maryland's program that's different from the other states is that our program has a signature bird program. And what this means is that each community chooses a bird that's their signature bird to represent their city or campus. And that can be either a migratory bird that somehow comes through their um, community or a resident bird that's easily recognizable to their community. And signature birds are just a way that communities can use to educate uh, community members about the beautiful birds that live in our state and whether it's here for a stopover, it's its critical nesting habit, habitat or it's winter habitat, um, communities can choose whatever bird most resonates for their community. La Plata has chosen the purple martin, Annapolis has the osprey, um, Salisbury has the great blue heron. Um, we welcomed our first bird city in 2020, which um, was La Plata in Southern Maryland. And they have really embraced being a bird city. They are about to renew for their second time. Um, they have, as I said, the purple martin as their Signature bird, they have used a, um, I think it's a $50,000 grant from the Maryland Historical Trust to create a bird city tourism initiative around Purple Martins. So they have Purple Martin statues and license plates and passports, and they're really, um, they've gone all in, which is really exciting to see. Um, Salisbury University was our first university um to join the program and maryland is the only program uh, they, they just one other state has started it. maryland was the first program to have um universities and colleges be recognized as bird campuses um salisbury has a very active community engagement with um salisbury university with the um non-academic community um, and a lot of ongoing ornithological research on campus. Um, their students wrote their application. This is, I, it's, I'm not expecting anybody to read it, but just sort of a demonstration of how um, one of the projects around, uh, ornithology projects on campus, they have um, a lot of uh, bird nest box, not nest boxes on campus that also have um, webcams as part of them so that um, the entire community can uh, see what's happening. And um, they've also worked with their local bird club to reduce threats by making the glass on a lot of campus buildings bird safe glass. So that's sort of the background of what a bird city is. Um, and as I said before, it could be a, a county, which we don't have any counties recognized yet. Um, it can be a campus and it can be any type of city that at least has some type of elected official that can sign off on a resolution. Um, to get started, um, as I mentioned before, you're gonna create a team that's gonna help you fill out your application. So I hope everybody who's listening is thinking, I wanna be on a bird city team um, for your community. And um, these are the requirements for applying. 
So um, our application is online and we have four categories that each category has a series of actions. And as I said, you only need 10 actions to get approved. Um, and the actions are, um, uh, like I said, the four top categories. And then um, you have to pass a resolution and host an annual World Migratory Bird Day. Plus, so that's sort of two actions and then eight other actions. You have to have three in the habitat category and one each in each of the other three categories. And 20 actions would be for the high flyer designation. So if you get recognized, um, you get guidance from our um, program on the different issues and actions that your community can take. You get guidance on the application and renewal process. Um, recognition materials include signs, banners, press releases, and new with the national platform is a custom website that will showcase um, all the work that your community is doing. So once I finish the slide deck, I'll give you a quick tour through what, um, what the website looks like. Well, this is sort of a, a sneak peek. So each state has their own website. And then um, each community gets their own web page. So this is La Plata's page under Bird City Maryland's homepage. And what they get on their page is an about us. And so they have a little blurb about La Plata, where it is, a little blurb about their um, uh, signature bird. And then the achievements tab has um, all of their application content. So if you're like, wow, I wonder what La Plata did in the habitat assessment and management category, you can go and see what they uploaded um, to tell their story and it will have photographs or documents supporting whatever that action is. And that's the case for all the four different categories. There's also an events page. So um, the community can post any events um, that are upcoming around being a bird city. And then each community also gets a tourism tab where they can choose from these different topics. So um, my hope is that um, people will come to visit communities because they are recognized as a bird community and they could go onto that community's webpage and find out birding locations, where to eat, where to stay when they visited that community. So if you think your community might be interested in becoming a bird city, um, this is sort of what you would do, your next steps. And you would visit and look at our action list, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, contact us, that's me, form your team. You would complete your application <clears throat> and then promote your work through the webpage. So that's sort of the background. I'm gonna pop out of um, sort of presenting about the program itself um, just to finish up the presentation um, before I go on to the um, website, just to think like I'm teasing out actions that um, homeowners could do that are part of our actions um, within the city application. Um, so I thought I'd just start with things that would really have big impact for birds. And I wanted to start with native plants. Um, as we talked about with the oak tree in particular, um, native plants support um, <clears throat> large varieties of insect life, insect life, which is really important for um, birds, as well as um, with nectar for things like hummingbirds. And then this concept of soft landings, I actually just learned about, I had never heard of it, but it basically wants homeowners to rethink about what they do with under their tree canopy. So the fact that if you keep old leaves um, underneath your trees, then you're inviting beneficial insects to have their whole full life cycle in your yard under the tree. 
versus if you're putting down like a, a weed blocking cloth or mowing under the tree. So just imagining that that you're under your trees is actually a whole habitat that is really important to insect life. Um, so I thought that was a great example of things that folks could do. There's lots of information out there on plants that are particularly helpful <clears throat> in supporting bird conservation. Um, and Audubon's native plant da database, which you can find online, you can just put in your zip code and it will give you um, excellent plants that are beneficial for bird life for wherever in the state you live. Um, uh, Fish and Wildlife also has a fantastic Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping Guide. It's 82 pages, it's super detailed, and um, you can access that online as well, and they will mail you one. And then um, I just wanna encourage everyone to think about alternatives to pesticides as um, <clears throat> it's really important to not use them when you're thinking about insect and bird health. Um, books that I think, I think my favorite, and I'm sure I imagine many in the audience are familiar with Douglas Ptolemy. He's out of University of Delaware. Um, his book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard and really talks about all the things that I was just mentioning. Um, and then there's also lots of wonderful online, um, resources, um, both the National Bird City Network and, um, Maryland's page, and I'll show you that in a little bit, have resource tabs for folks that um, give them direct access to ways to um, remove threats to birds, find native plants, things like that. Um, this is the theme for World Migratory Bird Day this year, um, protect insects, protect birds. So each year, the Environment for the Americas um, comes up with a new theme. Last year, it was about how water supports bird life and each year they have a new artist and um, they develop an incredibly robust uh, resource guide for teachers, nature centers, um, individuals who are interested where you can um, plan your own World Migratory Bird Day celebration. So all of our communities um, get all of this information at the beginning of spring migration and use whatever the year's theme is to celebrate in whatever the way they want. There's no right way or right day on how we ask people to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day. Annapolis is having a, um, a bird photo contest at City Hall. Um, it can look like whatever your city wants it to look like. It can be part of an Earth Day celebration. It doesn't have to happen on like specific days. It could be in spring or fall migration. Um, so I just wanted to share that resource for you that's on the Environment for the Americas uh, World Migratory Bird Day website. Okay, and I'm just, this is my last slide, but I just wanted to thank all of you um, at the Maryland Natural History Society for planting native, keeping your cats indoors, using alternatives to pesticides, treating windows to be bird safe and making a difference. So thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And um, I think, Bronwyn, I'm going to try to grab the uh, um, website just so I can walk people through it. Yeah. OK, so let me reshare. And then I will have time for questions. Can you now see the, um, yep. okay, great. So this is the national website <clears throat> for the Bird City Network. And it has a series of tabs across the top. Um, I'm going to choose programs and communities so that we can go to Maryland's uh, site. But just for your information, this is the resources tab that I was telling you about. So they, um, they have um, a ton of different things about collisions, um, uh, cats, mostly collisions and cats. This is out of the American Bird Conservancy and they really focus on trying to reduce threats to birds by reducing collisions with glass. 
Um, and then they also have news events and tourism. So I'm gonna go to Maryland's page. I'll go slowly so we don't, so I'm gonna choose Maryland. Here's our beautiful common yellow throat. And then our page, our homepage has a little bit about us. And then we can also, and a little bit about our signature bird designation. And then we can also choose communities. So I'm gonna go to, I'll go to Washington College. And um, Washington College uh, is a pretty special place. I don't know if anyone's been able to visit the Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory, but they actually have a, um, a glass testing tunnel there where they have a mist netting program and a bird banding program. And then they're one of two places in the country where the American Bird Conservancy does testing on bird safe glass. Um, so uh, this was their celebration when they got their sign. They were having a bird walk out at the River and Field comp uh, Campus. Um, so if you wanna see what they put in their application, you would go to their achievements tab and it just has our different actions and then their story of how they responded to whatever it was. This was, you know, demonstrate your community has been awarded tree campus status. Um, and then they have their own events tab and tourism tab. And each category in the application also has, uh, you know, uh, their whatever they filled out of the different actions. There's usually 10 or 20 or more actions per category. Um, obviously having a glass testing tunnel is not something that most campuses are gonna have. Um, so that was pretty unique that they were able to actually fill, fill that out. Um, many campuses have a lot of education and engagement and sustainability initiatives. So um, any community that's wondering, you know, what it looks like to be a bird campus can then select one of our campuses and read their story on the webpage. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And that sort of brings me to an end. And I would love to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much. Let me get a spotlight on you. Okay, whatever that means. <laughs> okay, I just spotlighted you. There you go. All right, so do we have any questions about, thank you so much, Bird City. Dawn said that she went to Washington College before it was a Bird City. It's a gorgeous area. Yes, it is. Um, so you mentioned that it seems like it would be kind of, I mean, is it easier if it's a small town or a small community? We were, if our Baltimore County is so huge, how would that, how would that work? It, I have to say it does seem that it is easier. Um, if like our small communities like La Plata, um, you know, you just get the mayors on board, the town council, the town clerk, filled everything out with a bird club member and it was pretty easy for them to fill out the application. <clears throat> Slightly larger communities like Annapolis and Salisbury actually has sustainability coordinators. Um, so that's sort of that person who would be the um, main person who's filling out the application. Um, in terms of who's upcoming in the docket, um, Middletown, the city of Frederick, um, Brunswick in Frederick County, Westminster in Carroll County, all are actively working on their applications right now. Um, Hood College as well in um, the city of Frederick. So it's really great when you have sort of the town gown thing um, going. I'm working with the city of Chestertown since we have Washington College. And then the College of Southern Maryland is very close to La Plata. Um, so big cities like Baltimore, Baltimore is already an urban bird treaty city, um, one of only 10 in the country. So they would be a clear, um, excellent choice to uh, become a bird city. Um, it's been a little bit challenging. I've been working with Lindsay Jacks, who mentioned earlier, um, and all the work that they do in Baltimore and Patterson Park Audubon. There's so many great things that are happening around birds in Baltimore. 
But finding that person at the city government level who's willing to do the lift of that component, I haven't yet found that person. So if anybody in the audience has a great suggestion, um, I'd love to hear it because um, Baltimore would be a wonderful, uh, wonderful choice. But it, it does actually become more complex with bigger cities um, just to sort of get your finger on all the different aspects of what a city's doing. When you're smaller, I think it's easier. And when you're a campus, it's even easier. Um, our campus applications, two of the four were filled out by students um, with a professor overseeing it. One was a Chesapeake Conservation Corps um, postgrad, and it was her capstone project for Washington College. And then Salisbury University was fully filled out by students. Um, the University of Maryland College Park, which just became a bird campus last week, um, ha is actually considered an arboretum and botanical gardens. And so uh, one of their arborists fill out, filled out the application. Um, ideally, it's a team, um, just because uh, that way you can put your fingers on the different pieces. And ideally, it has a bird club member. Um, uh, so any bird club members out there um, who have communities that they think would be a good fit, um, please let me know because my goal is to grow our program so that it's as big as Wisconsin's um, in terms of, you know, we're small, but um, we are growing and it's really exciting to have this position where I'm actually able to focus my attention on it now that it's been funded um, part time. Great. Belmar asks, what is, um, uh, could, could they see the slide again with the steps or what are the steps to get to follow until the application? Sure. I will figure out my way back that. And I just saw what is a bird club member. So there's two um, types of bird clubs in Maryland. Some of them are under the Maryland Ornithological Society. So Anne Arundel Bird Club, um, Baltimore Bird Club, those are all um, under the, what's called MOS. And then the other ones all come under um, Audubon Mid-Atlantic. So it's one or the other, and it's usually a county-wide, it might even be a tri-county um, bird club uh, that depending on if it's a more rural area. Okay, I'm gonna try to go back to PowerPoint. Give me one second on that. Think of more questions and... Sorry, navigating back and forth is not my strong suit. I can get there. I had a question for you, Pamela. Sure. Hold on one second. I'm just sure. going to. It was the slide on how to, I think, is what next steps. Maybe it's this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Let me see if I can do it as the full slide. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, somebody said I had a question. Hi, yes, thanks, it's uh, Tabby. Um, I was so happy that you highlighted the effort to prevent um, bird collisions with glass and windows. Mm -hmm. That's been um, something I've been trying to promote as well. I am not a member of a bird club currently, but I'm looking to become one. I'm just a bird nerd among my social groups, but there's a specific um, building going up in Southwest Baltimore where I live that is like seven stories of glass windows that are very reflective. And I'm trying to figure out um, where to start, like to find out if they're planning to make that, um, you know, anti-collision glass or like what to do um, to promote that if they don't have a plan for it right now. Absolutely, and that's a fantastic question. So. Um, Maryland passed the Sustainable Buildings Act last year, which requires that all new buildings that receive state, some portion of state funding have to have bird safe glass as part of the construction. Um, it's way easier if you aren't retrofitting your building for bird safe glass. So bird safe glass, if those of you who might not be familiar with it, has some type of fritting in it that the birds can see. You might, you and I, 
don't not see it um, if it's front ended like that. Um, but the birds can see it and they won't collide with it because they can see that it's there and it's not just a reflection of the sky. Um, if you're sort of aftermarket approaching this, which is what I think you're asking about, it gets way trickier um, because uh, then you have to go in and put dots that have to be like in a certain spacing so that the birds can see them. Um, or there's something called a cropian bird savers, which is like um, cord that goes in a vertical hanging um, down the window. So it's it's very sort of awkward to go about it after the fact. Um, so I guess I would start to like find out, are they using bird safe glass if it's this new glass building? Um, if not, I would encourage you to go to the American Bird Conservancy's um, website because they really focus on um, what you should do if you didn't have it to begin with and how you can retrofit your building um, to be bird safe. They definitely, like um, DNR in Annapolis went in after the fact and just did one of the two things that I was telling you about. They put in these uh, a, co a copian, I think it's called bird savers. Um, and the Patuxent Research Refuge has basically wrapped their glass windows with something that the birds can see. Um, but when you're inside, you, you can still see out. So there are solutions out there. It's way better if, you know, communities go in on the front end with bird safe glass than to have to do it after the fact. But I think it's really great that you're thinking about it. And, um, Hopefully one of the parts of Bird City, Maryland is it's educating communities to enact um, municipal um, laws that are local that are requiring this. So just because Maryland has this at the state level, it's only for buildings that receive state funding that doesn't, you know, that doesn't speak to any privately funded buildings. Um, so bringing this issue to attention of communities is part of sort of the mission of Bird City, Maryland, um, in hopes that they, and there are small communities that are doing really good work around this, but a lot of it's education um, so that they know that, you know, what the possibilities are for them with new buildings. Great, right. thank you so much. And, and you can unshare now, we got okay. that. So Marjorie um, said that she they came in late and um, wanted to know they uh, is there a minimum size of communities that are not in a city or town that can permit can participate. The the thing that like people have asked can my community organization you know like my HOA um, and some HOAs and community organizations are bigger than small unincorporated towns. Um, so I'm definitely interested in working it, it, there does need to be some aspect of an elected official, um, in terms of the towns that, so that they can, um, pass the resolution. Um, so that's sort of where the minimum size comes in. If a county wants to apply, and we haven't had this in Maryland, but Iowa has a lot of counties, it would be something that it would come from. And, and having your county designated doesn't mean that the different communities within the county could not be a bird city inside a bird county. Um, but at the county level, it would be in the office of the county executive, whoever their sustainability person would be, would sort of take the lead on filling out the application. Okay, does that answer your question, Marjorie? All right. Any uh, any other questions um, for Pamela tonight? Who, who, how many Bird City, Maryland uh, people we have on here are going to be contacting Pamela to get their community uh, engaged after tonight? Uh, let us know. And what can we do? Um, as the different organizations and uh, like the Natural History Society of Maryland, what can we do to help support your efforts? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And we're always looking for partners. Um, 
to support our efforts. So I think having an event like this where um, community members know about the program so that they can help to bring their community in. Um, I, I just saw that pop up in the chat I, that doesn't have to have an elected official. Um, I think I think it does in some shape or form have to have some type of elected official. Um, I will check at the national level to see if there's any communities that are working without that feature. Um, uh, and I can let Bronwyn know when I get the answer to that. Um, but I think, I think education and engagement is really important. Um, so just like my like end slides that we're talking about the actions of, you know, interested, curious, scientifically passionate people and thinking about the fact that having uh, their community be healthy for birds benefits, just like sort of thinking about the canary in the coal mine, like birds need clean air and we need clean air and birds need habitat and we need habitat um, and they need clean water and we need clean water. So uh, supporting a community that's healthy for birds and people is really our goal. Um, and educating communities on ways they can do this through our actions is uh, sort of how we get them there. And I put new actions in all the time. And I recently came to learn about tree equity issues. And um, so now I have written action in that if your community is actively working on issues around tree equity and making sure that underserved neighborhoods that typically don't have a higher tree habitat are growing tree habitat, then they get an action point. Or I learned about a program called Birdability, where it was a map, a national map of birding trails that were ADA accessible. So I'm able to put that action into my action list to educate communities that this is a possibility um, that they could be doing in their community. So it's it can be very fluid. I try to change it, and um, as I learn about new things that are happening. Um, that would be good for our communities to learn about. And will you, are you open to suggestions if we read through there and say, oh, wait, 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 so we know somebody who's doing this. And this could be something Absolutely, else. that's how I learn, you know? And so that's one of the reasons I really like it is that um, it has a lot of flexibility as I learn new things that are important. I can figure out where they would fit best in those four overreaching categories and add an action. And that's how we educate our communities on what they can do. Tabby asks, um, are y'all hiring? That would be wonderful. <laughs> um, not that I know of right now, um, uh, but uh, I will keep you posted. Well, where does the funding come from? So my position is, um, my supervisor is DNR, um, but it is, but the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership is a 501c3. Um, and then the funding stream has one of these convoluted trails that doesn't make any sense to me, <laughs> but that's how it works for them to, for them to be able to sort of support the work. Um, Cause we, we try to focus on species of greatest conservation need in Maryland. Um, and that supports the work of the DNR um, and Fish and Wildlife. So I, I try to make sure that uh, we have actions in each category specifically focusing on species of greatest conservation need. What, what are those? What, can you, can you, we have, say there's, you over, there's a lot, like a lot of our birds um, fit into that category. So I don't know them off. There's like hundreds, I guess, sadly. <laughs> Um, so I wish I could tell you off the top of my head, but I absolutely can't. I do have it as on that resources tab. Um, and I just saw, uh, so I do have it up there. I'm just looking at the chat to Kathleen's question. I just read an article about the lead in shot. Um, I think, and that's a great question. Um, I will follow it. And I will think about whether, and this is a perfect example, I'm writing myself a note right now, Kathleen, um, to see if there's, um, to me, that would come in our reducing and removing threats to birds um, category. So let me um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. 
this is an example of how I can make sure we have an action written specifically around that so that our communities can take action to keep uh, the lead shot out of our bird. Uh, population oh, just, even out of out of our um deer and then you have the you know vultures and the eagles that are um feeding on the and getting lead poisoning yeah if you just for the folks who might not be familiar with that um with the issue at at hand with the lead shot do you want to just say uh one thing about that kathleen Did you want to unmute and say something, Kathleen, about it? Okay, but do you want to say something about it, Pamela? <laughs> that's, that's, that's I mean, I think I think that um, I don't know that I can speak to it more than what I just said, um, but frequently. Um, can you our... hear me now? Oh. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, this is Kathy. I'm the one who's been putting in that little note there. Nice. Um, what I'd like to do is I can share a link. I actually sent something to um, National Historical Society of Maryland the other day, which was an ad about it. Somebody in Maryland is proposing replacing, removing leg from um, shot, which is used in hunting because a lot of um, it's raptors and scavengers eat and subsequently have lead poisoning. And I unfortunately have had the experience where I've had to take part in putting raptors down because they have so much lead in their system that they're, they're, they're basically imbeciles. Uh, you know, we talk about lead poisoning, birds are a lot smaller. It's a very, and I did a little bit of research, not a lot, because I'm not a hunter. But the thing is, is there are alternatives. It's just that it would cost a little bit more. And I did not go as far as to find out how much the alternative would be. But there is an alternative to lead shot. It's used in California. And there's an alternative to lead that's used in sinkers in fishing. And so it's just a matter of a few extra dollars. In, and again, I don't know how much it would be, but California has it in place. And I was gonna say, if nothing else, California always does a lot of research up and down. So if I had spent more time on it, I probably could have gone into California's webpage and just said, you know, for the average hunter who goes out hunting six weekends a year or whatever like that, what's the additional cost? It might be 20 bucks. But I'll tell you, seeing a bird that is 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 damaged by lead is emotionally heart wrenching because mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do, mm -hmm. and it, it it it's just I I can't even it, I I can flash back to it and it's ugly. It's really really ugly. And I think that we that that would be something I would hope that Bird City could do because when I first learned about it, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. We've gotten rid of lead paint, lead this, lead that, lead this. And you can still go out and use lead. And we have alternatives. So it really should, I think if we made it popular, I would think that even people who are still on this call as I rattle on, see all these people have left. I'm sorry, I'm boring them to tears. But it's really important. It's really important. Please, please try and get that message out. I'm trying as hard as I can. Thank you. And I had yeah. recently read about that. Um, and that's a perfect example, Kathleen, of something that I can put into the application to help educate our communities. Because um, a lot of times, as you said, people don't know. Um, for example, there are a couple of... Uh, non-native species of plants, Nandina and heavenly bamboo that are very toxic to birds. And I have that as a line item in one of our actions. And the College of Southern Maryland, the president of the college basically made a proclamation banning it from campus. And they went and removed every Nandina and heavenly bamboo bush from their three campuses because they had learned about it from the application. So I really see the application as a tool to educate communities. 
And I will absolutely work on a way to fit that in, um, probably, as I said, in the reducing and removing threats to birds. And I always try to have links, like you said, for alternatives um, to lead either for the shot or the sinker. So I will, um, I'll definitely get on that. Um, can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I am putting the link. I'm hoping there's the ad. Oh, hold on. Let me send it to you because you aren't going to be able to write it down. Okay. Anybody who is still on this call, please, because like I said, I'm, I'm very, you know, I love raptors. There, I've, I've got two parrots in my house, which are the closest I can get to raptors. Um, it, it, I, I wasn't aware of this. You know, I was not aware that we still had lead in our in in our shot. So I think if we could get the message out, it would be really helpful. And again, just please, people, if you're still on, share it because I think it's really important. And if you look at that web page, you'll just start crying because it's a picture of a bald eagle that has lead poisoning, and it just it shakes you straight to the heart. It's really sad. Well, thank you, Kathy, for um, for bringing this to our attention again, and um, I think that we'll be you'll be seeing it added to the Bird City. So hopefully, this ripple effect will will roll right through, and some of the communities that are already involved in the program might see this and um, and take it on. Are there I, any I really. Questions? You're, I really appreciate, and I'm sorry I talked, but please, it's just, thank you so much for letting me interrupt your presentation, which I enjoyed immensely, but thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions right now? Um, and you have your email, uh, Pamela, that you want to put in the, in the chat box, maybe, sure. if people want to uh, contact you directly, mm -hmm. they can do that and say, sign me up, I'm ready. That'll be fantastic. Of uh, uh, Bird City, Maryland, and um, I'm pretty sure that's. I never email myself. I'm gonna double check. <laughs> that's my email. There we go. All right, coordinator at MarylandBirds.org. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and 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 sharing this wonderful program with us. Um, I hope that together we can uh, bring online more and more communities um, that are bird uh, bird communities of Maryland and campuses. Um, and hopefully this is the start of a wonderful partnership and saving and conserving more birds and habitat. So everybody, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week when we learn about the evolution of the Appalachian Mountains on our Must Learn Thursday, and come see us on Sunday for our open hours at the museum and visit the Ice Age in Maryland. Uh, till then, stay well, stay curious, and stay outside. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bronwyn.